The present is not a time factor. It isn't a time factor. It's environmental. The total environment in action is it. Now, it is figure ground, Gestalt style. The it is not the figure, it's the ground. So where it's at is not the uh, world championship tonight. That's not it. That's figure. It is... Come on in. There's Come on there. In. Sit, Don't sit, sit right Come here. On, squeeze. It is ground, not figure. Now, this is Just move. This is another... Another problem you might want to know, for example, you may have interests in education or in generation gaps or anything at all, but remember, it doesn't, what women's lib. Women's lib is not necessary, necessarily where it's at. <coughs> but women's lib is not necessarily an answer. It may be the problem, it may not. But... Um, Somebody said, 20th century man is a man who runs down the stri street shouting, I've got the answers, what are the questions? Quest answers are easy, questions are hard. And if you didn't know that, you might spend an awful lot of your time looking for answers when you really should be looking for questions. The questions are the ground, and the answers <coughs> are merely figures that can be replaced at will. And they're individual to each person, they're not for everybody. Apropos of the figure ground interplay, which is very much relates to the world of the simultaneous, the Vietnam thing can be played this way. Uh, Vietnam is not the question and is not the answer. It is the interval or gap between two things that are really tro troublesome. <coughs> it is a, like the space between the wheel and the axle. The gap is where the action is, by the way. The noise, the hubbub, and the action is where the gap is. But the question isn't necessarily there at all. The question uh, about Vietnam is, as the whole Western world goes east, goes inward, as Western man electrically turns inward on his own being, and as Eastern man turns outward using electric, or rather uh, Western technology, as that huge reciprocal reversal occurs and has occurred, the interface between East and West is a huge gap called Vietnam. It is not where the action is at all. The action is in the East going outward and the West going inward, and those huge components are banging together in Vietnam and making a great noise, but there's nothing in Vietnam of the slightest consequence. There's no, there's no oil, there's no, there are no people who matter, and there are no resources that matter. It's a great big vacuum between these two huge things that are going on. But a vacuum is never empty. <coughs> in this sense. No, it's noisy. But it's acoustic. Now, if Vietnam were suddenly quieted down by pressure, might not uh, the uh, hub uh, the between the wheel and the axle, might not it suddenly shift? Might there not be a tremendous uproar begin in a slightly different place? Where do you think it might be reasonable to suppose the next uproar might break out in the world if Vietnam is suppressed? Because America. I don't think so, because you couldn't imagine the East and the West banging together against South America, or against in Africa, <coughs> Middle East, <coughs> Middle East, Middle East, which is very much more dangerous territory than Vietnam. Very much more lubrication there. More explosive. <laughs> Not lubrication. No. <laughs> Inflammable. Let me speak in hardware trade. No, it'd get uptight. No, it wouldn't lubricate. It would have the exact with lots of oil. You mean no you mean But it would uh, it would be it would ignite, that's the trouble. Exactly. It would ignite, not lubricate. Exactly. Well, well, well. But now the exact as dropout phrase means <coughs> that at the speed of light, which is the normal speed used in all management and all uh, decision making today, uh, no existing job structure will hold. Now this is 
This we propose as a, as a proposition that the organization chart will not hold in any establishment, in education, in entertainment, in business, or in politics, or even in war. The organization chart will not hold. The organization chart is based on written command. It's, it an, old, it's an old the form. Bottom. It's an old form that came in with the Renaissance. Whereas the telephone bypassed them all, and all forms of electric communication bypassed the organization chart. In action, in actual practice. You so just see your own organizations and see how they work. In this Not how they're structured on the chart, but how they work. In this book, though, we explore what will take the place of the job, if the job will not hold anymore. And what, is, what automatically pops up in place of jobs? Aside from Bell Telephone, do you know of any organization institution that functions without the transfer of paper? Yeah, but the most now bypass the written memo. The BBC in England commands that all no phones used and all memos be written. Just as Bell System does. <coughs> <laughs> Just go into AT&T and you'll see all instructions are in writing. All business is conducted in writing. And your business with the public is done over the telephone. When you say business, you mean service, not business. Service. Uh, the public, after all, is being serviced. No, the public is buying a function. Well, telephone. a service, yeah. But business is different from service. That's their business. The public, <laughs> their business is different from the public. If organizational charts are all gone. No, they're what? there, they're visible, but they're not effective. Okay. okay. How does that affect the systems analysis techniques, which really depend upon that kind of well, this, this is a very good question. It simply means that system analysis techniques are all looking at the past instead of the present. That is, they're constructing schemes as though the organization chart would work, when in fact it's a uh, dead issue. It doesn't work anymore in that form, mm -hmm. as system analysis analysts would have it. What's, vi what's viable in system you know, analysis? Uh, yeah. Working in the small group that understand what the problems are. So well, all explain explain why systems analysis <coughs> won't work, if it, because they, they, it's, well, uh, it's, we, it's, it's a great big package system, deal that everybody's yeah. supposed to be buying. System, uh, system analysis, of course, when it starts with uh, any business organization, starts with the black boxes of the organization chart as though they were still valid. And then it says, now let's see how we can make this system work. And get the noise out. It doesn't you know, get the noise out and, and, and speed up the flow of information in these channels as if the information were hardware, mm -hmm. just to be fed in like pieces of, like things. Well, this, is an, this is another basic theme that it's not, a, again, it's just theme, it's not a question answer problem. I uh, joke there is garbage in and gossip out. <laughs> that's, garbage that's in good. and gossip out? Gossip well, that's hopeful. <laughs> well, yes, uh, except that it also means the end of the organization chart. Yeah. The organization chart demands specialism, each person on the job doing his job, everybody in his place and the place for everybody. Well, it can be put another way. You can say <coughs> the organization chart is treasure in and garbage out, whereas the artist or the man who is doing anything in a situation takes the garbage and produces treasure. Transforms it. So this is As Yeats put it, garbage in, treasure's out. Now that my ladder's gone, I must lie down where all the ladders start in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. The poet always begins with garbage transforms it into treasure. And um, so does the inventor. But the organization uh, and the systems boys simply uh, garbage in, garbage out is their own, form their own formula for their own activity. But they don't realize it's treasure in and garbage out. And there's another thing they don't realize is that garbage means literally clothing. That's what, that's where the way you look up in the dictionary, you'll find that's what it means. That's where it came from, garb. And why should garbage be clothing? Discarded clothing, old hat. Um, <laughs> but well, here's a, let me let me tell you something rather strange. There's a play by Pirandello called to, "To Clothe the Naked," which was played here a few months ago. And the theme of that play concerns the problem of news coverage of various people in the play. News coverage is clothing. 
and a clothing desperately demanded by modern man. That's why you have hijackers and bank robbers. They're desperate for coverage to be clothed, their nakedness to be hidden by news, news coverage. The need for coverage has become, for example, the, one of the main things in the north of Ireland activities. They rush out to throw bombs and rush in to watch themselves throwing the bombs on television. In and out. They are surrounded there by there are more people from uh, foreign countries watching those events than there are people participating in them by hundreds of times more people. <coughs> Did you realize that the news coverage today is the big, uh, biggest industry in the world and occupies many times more people than are involved in the fighting anywhere? There are far more people covering Vietnam than are in Vietnam. Engaged in battle. <coughs> far more people engaged in the news services around the globe than are ever involved in any war. War, in other words, the news has become the war. And if all news were to cease, there wouldn't be any war. Now, and this is not saying, therefore, it ought to cease. That, isn't, that doesn't follow. But literally, if all coverage of all events in re relation to violence, if it all to stop, there wouldn't be any violence. So in here we say that the Third World War is a war of icons. It's a war, of, a war of images. We can do better, anything better than you can. We can yes, do sir. anything this better. Yes, sir. This man has his hand up. Yes, sir. Is, uh, no, 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 no. No, no. You may have noticed that he has carefully as to avoided all coverage for himself of late weeks uh, because uh, he realizes that there is something wrong with uh, the effect it has. And uh, But it's a war of icons. However, the you asked that we're on another key theme. We can come back to this. This is just a theme that we're talking. We're not trying to analyze problems at the moment. We're just mentioning themes that appear in this book. It's the concern with the shift from hardware to software as we move out of the 19th century, and it's not easy to get into the 20th century for countries like uh, North America. Backward countries can go into the 20th century quite easily. Africa can. China, India can. But very hard for uh, the UK or for Europe or for the USA to get into the 20th century. Too much hardware is our problem. We have too much to lose by becoming electronic. But the fact is that um, at electric speed, which is the speed of light, man, in a sense, loses his body. On the telephone, you don't have a body. You go to New York and back in, this, in one instant or a split instant, and uh, so does the party you're talking to. You are literally discarnate and minus f bones and flesh when you're on radio, television, telephone, or any electric medium. So you can be many places at once electrically. You can be all over the world. Any, any, any one of our bodies can be plastered all over this planet instantly by <coughs> Sputnik and so on. So, Marshall, when we have engineers like myself talking about transportation as speeding up, so that uh, they, as one uh, person was saying at the University of Michigan last week, where I happen to be, they in 20 years, or uh, as he put it, in the year 2073, why people will be able to travel from one side of the world to another in three minutes, anywhere in the world in three minutes. He'd forgotten that we can travel anywhere in the world today as fast as the electric That's communication will take us. This was not apparent to him. We're already there, you see. There's no need for us to travel bodily across that, the world in three minutes. That is what is meant by the global village. It doesn't mean that the world is getting small. It means that we're everywhere simultaneously as if we all lived in a very small village, not, no larger than this room. The planet is no larger than this room so far as our bodies are concerned, electrically. We can be everywhere on this planet simultaneously. And everybody on this planet can be here simultaneously quite easily, and we can only we can turn on the TV set behind us. But <coughs> this simultaneous co-presence everywhere, sim at the same time, for everybody, is, no is not a, by any means a solution to anything because it deprives most people of their identity. Most people are just will not be able to have any Doesn't identity, whatever. Doctor. Yes, sir. Where? In the doorway? I had a question. Uh, the statement, where it's at, therefore, no. appears to have uh, two answers. It's both nowhere and it's everywhere, because we're everywhere no. at the same time, and at the same time, but in it, our arriving there, we're 
Just a moment, though. It, it does not necessarily refer to the figures uh, who are, well, about whom we're talking. It refers to the ground, the ground itself, meaning the total situation. The total situation uh, is the reference in it. It's raining means the whole blooming environment is in action, not some part of it. And uh, so where it's at in the, ele in the electric time is not, a, an, uh, not an easy question, I'd say. And I think rock and roll is as good a way of telling you where it's at as, as we know. The uh, function of music is to process the sounds of the new technologies and to hand them back to you filtered through the English language of the South, by the way not through the language of Chicago, Boston, or New York, but only southern speech can be used in music. We'll go into that if you like. Yes? Um, Marshall, would you say that under the electric conditions, as, as the body becomes disrupted, that it shifts from figure to ground? What, the body? Yes, the body then becomes ground under the electric conditions. I, I haven't thought about it. Uh, but uh, something certainly very strange has taken place. Violence, of course, is the scramble for identity when it's scarce. And um, it is electrically getting very scarce, and of course very, 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 most people are selling, sh selling it out very fast, too. Meantime, you'll see the red herrings are being thrown at us. Energy shortages, all sorts of hardware hang-ups are being thrown to distract you from what's going on in the world. That is people never talk <coughs> about what's going on today, always what was going on 30, 40 years ago. And that's true now and, and always will be. Te all technical <coughs> solutions have yes. new problems. So, man, yes, sir. You said a moment ago that, uh, that because everyone in the world, the, the <coughs> world of the global village now, that everyone can sort of communicate to this room. No, we can, everybody in the world can be here in this room, and we, everyone in this room can be everywhere in the world. And when you said because of that, uh, that we are, what, turning our bodies into Oh, no, the, this is by virtue of the fact that electrically we don't have bodies. Well, then, do you think that because, are you saying that, because, that we're going to sort of suffer an identity crisis because... That's already happened. Because we can't communicate? That's already happened. But is it a, is it a matter Communicate, of by the way, you know, means not the sending of some sort of data from A to B. It means changing the sender and the receiver. Communication means change. Communication doesn't mean transporting some data from one point to another. That isn't communication. That's just transportation, <coughs> not communication at all. Did communication means <coughs> changing the people you're talking to, and they're changing the speaker. Well, when I speak to you, I put you on. Right. And when you speak to me, you put me on. Right. Well, then, uh, you think because that I'm a member of the global village, as you speak of it, as, as being, uh, possibly being able to be uh, communicated into this room, that I will suffer... <coughs> This, will affect me, I will suffer some sort of this has already happened to you as much as it ever can happen. It, uh, it, that is, it's happened totally. Why? Why? Because, I mean, it happened long ago. It happened before you were born. That is, uh, we, you, be, you were living in the electric time before. Uh, you had time to uh, learn how to pronounce it. But it's, well, I'd say it's at least 50 years old. But a commercial telegraph came in 1830 and was used by Lincoln to fight a war. He fought the war from the White House. He was on the firing line, the first head of state to fight a war from headquarters to the firing line. Um, 1860s, of course. In 1860s, was he... Uh, Already in the Global Village, yes. And he suffered some sort of crisis. And notice what happens in the Global Village. Icons, the image of Lincoln, the image of the fighting parties becomes the main ammunition. That is a that is another question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it existed for him. I mean, and I'm not sure that it's easy for us in this room to focus an image of ourselves. But you're saying that the image of ourselves is drastically affected by the fact that we are a member of the global village. Yes, that we are in totally new forms and of inter-association. It's already happened. We are in new forms of association altogether. <coughs> Something that never happened before the electric time. People never had that form of association ever in human history. Right. It's different. Totally different. 
And this is where it's at. A new ground. Yeah, this is what we're talking about. It's not a new figure, it's a new ground. It's a new ballpark, not a new ball game. There's somebody here that was really anxious. <laughs> yep, another, uh, another question. Yeah, don't mistake okay. the ballpark for the ball game. Yeah. Um, you made the point that um, we are sort of discussing the ball game. Yeah. And then you said, well, we suffer the identity. Speak, speak up for the others. And then, and then that because of this, we, we suffer an identity. But, but I, I've it's a rip-off. We've just had our little old private selves ripped right off. But I think they're gone. There's, there's more to, uh, to an identity than the, than the body. Right. Yes. Uh, all right, but the, the, an, the angelic <laughs> part remains, uh, for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Uh, you, the old song, I Never Met an Angel, is no longer singable. <laughs> I never met an angel, because angels are so rare. <laughs> it, but do you know the rest of it? <laughs> Until the day that one comes along, I'll string along with you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but now there's no lack of angels. You ain't got nothing else. <laughs> that's all that's left. And uh, so it's, it's rather... Uh, it's rather easy to see why people might have some difficulty about maintaining moral standards <coughs> in an, an angelic universe. <laughs> as far as they're concerned, the moral standards belong to the old hardware, when people still had bodies. But uh, remember, in a global, in a, uh, the uh, the interplay between people at the uh, instant, the speed of light, uh, the interplay is uh, rather amorphous, and. Um, the images are very, very much overlaid and overlapping. Joyce uses the phrase, why do I am a look-alike a pot of porter peas? Why does everybody look like peas porridge hot in the pot? Uh, everybody's just sort of mixed up in the porridge. Now, suppose people really did know what was happening, and incidentally, they never have in any period of human past ever known what was happening to them. They always look back 50 years to get their bearings. Now, uh, suppose we really did know what everybody was sure that what was happening is as thus and thus, and therefore, if that is the case, then there we might do this or this. Now, this has never risen before, but we do suggest in this book that for the first time, because of the speed of light, for the first time, it is possible to know where it's at, and it is possible to program the future. To anticipate the effects before the causes. Yeah, this get in with the effects. Get in with the effects before the causes come, and making the effects, choosing the effects before the causes are brought. About. Yes, sir. Um, following one of following your metaphor along is communication as okay. putting on. That was also relating to what your original definition of garbage is. Well, clothing. Putting on. Clothing. Yes. Clothing, um, which seems to be kind of a com a commentary on the effect. Uh, or the true substance, or lack of substance, of this communication, i.e., oh, no. that it isn't really real, what that it isn't really... No, it's not. It doesn't, it doesn't say, it doesn't follow it isn't real, but it doesn't have any of the components that we formerly attributed to the real. What do you get now is a pattern, not a package. No more packages. Nothing to consume. Just patterns to recognize. Pattern recognition takes over from all previous package deals. The consumer age is over for everybody. It also takes over from the two-bit width of the computer, which reduces everything to yes or no. <laughs> you don't be afraid of metaphors. Uh, they're, the, they're, they're, they're all you've got. It's all you've got. Because language is metaphor. All language, all language is metaphor. And uh, without language, you don't have metaphor and vice versa. Yeah, but what I was trying to say is that... Uh, um, the communication really can't become, I think, totally where it's at. Just a moment. Now, you're which kind of communication are you talking about? I'm talking about the the, uh, the pervasive presence that you're talking about. Just a moment. The, the communication, remember, we were mentioning is a process <coughs> of change in which everybody is transformed. It's right. not a question it's of everybody right. staying and waiting for a package to arrive, you know, like a telegram, right. which you open and read. Yeah, were you saying that the change is, is a discorporation? No, no, that has happened, yes. That's one of the, uh, that is one of the communications we received from the electric form. 
Remember, the electric form has a peculiar character. It's instantaneous. And this automatically bypasses the human body. It doesn't have that character. So the moment you speed up to the speed of light, well, you don't automatically are bypassed by your own technology. And it goes around you like your nervous system. And so you now have a complete brain, as it were, outside you, but it has nothing much to do with your brain. How did the human body adapt to that? Really Whoever said it had or will. I don't see any likelihood that it will adapt. Why it's it? gone. The how human, can the human body exist? Well, it, it's all right. You might as well ask, how can 19th century industry exist in the electric age? It's, it's a hangover. You're hungover, man. You still got a body. <laughs> <laughs> you talk to a person the same way over the phone as you do in person. I'll know tomorrow morning. I've got to talk to uh, which university is it tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock here in this room. I've got an intercom. I hate them because you can't see. I can see you people, but on, the, on one of these horrible conference calls, you can't see a thing. The telephone is a very peculiar instrument. <coughs> But uh, we, uh, it's electric, but it also has some very peculiar dimensions that uh, are totally unlike radio. Uh, mm. Radio is okay, but telephone is a vicious instrument. Uh, it, uh, the things it does to you, the user, is fantastic. Um, a lot of hands up. No, you've had a bit of say, and <laughs> there's one back there. I'm not uh, wanting you not to have say, it's just uh, giving others a chance. Yes. Could you give me some sort of tangible uh, effect? Or the intangible. Messed me up in a way that, uh, say, someone who is well documented, uh, a, a well documented personality like Shakespeare, right? Just for an example. Um, in one way, every once in a while, I, every once in a while, I read something, you know, from Shakespeare, who, and he has observed something the very same way I might have observed something. He may have said something more love the way I might. Have listen, said. listen to a line of Shakespeare. The way of I, I I'll quote him to you on Just the minute, subject. One second. The way I have observed something from Shakespeare, you know, I might have sort of observed something about love the same way he has. Well, could you, sort of some sort of tangible effect, a tangible yes. effect on me. Why am I different from Shakespeare? Shakespeare. Well, He's more moment. creative, I know. Right, just <laughs> much more brilliant and everything. But just a moment. Uh, Shakespeare says, the poets, uh, the poets, uh, how does it begin, Lee? Uh, the poet, poet's eye, in a fine frenzy, rolling, from earth to heaven, from heaven to earth. Bodies forth, the forms of things unknown, and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. The physical here and nowness of language has this magical power to confer local habitation by naming things. And that's what we're trying to do right here. In the world of magical, and incidentally, electricity is all magic, uh, science fiction is, belongs to the 19th century compared to electricity. Electricity is all magic. In that world of magic, most people cry out for roots. What they want is something stable. You, you'll find that everyone in this room will be crying out for this within the next few months, if not already. Something to hang on to in a world of electric angelism. And the pe seeking out of farms and of simple little plots of land to get your toes into is what's coming because of this need for roots and the need for local habitation and names. This is a deep human need, especially under electric conditions. I think over here, Marshall, <coughs> it's a difference in figure-ground relationship that yeah. our friend hasn't noted between him and Shakespeare. The time, um, the different ground, it was at a different place. Yeah. However, remember, that. Shakespeare was completely uh, ripped off, too. <coughs> Uh, in his time, the Gutenberg thing had come in and swiped out the whole feudal world which they had lived by for centuries. Yeah. It was gone. And so they were groping and griping madly. But that was an age of violent unrest and unhappiness. So we have that in common. Yes, and we automatically seek out people like that for companions. One of the amazing things about TV is if you see your hometown on TV this gives to your hometown a local habitation and a name that it doesn't have until it appears in a novel or on TV or in a movie. Mm -hmm. Now, when you, in other words, when you use another <coughs> medium, when you when you translate 
one thing into another medium, it gives it a new kind of strength. Isn't that just a spice to our yes. existence? Isn't that yes. just something that's nice? I mean, I would really like to see my face on TV, you know. No, I I'm, not, I, I'm, not I, going, I, I'm not going to suffer some sort of crisis if I don't. Uh, you are more likely to suffer if you did, because... It, <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. I think most people who have uh, seen them, it's like hearing your voice for the first time. It's rather a shock. Yeah. And when you see your face, it's not pleasant to see your face on TV. And people who have to teach on TV have a very bad time having to uh, play, you know, say their thing right into the uh, monitor, as it were. It's uh, very, very hard for the teacher to do that. But I don't see myself on TV. I'm well, just a university student. <laughs> don't worry. I'm not going to come across that. No, it, I think you're, we're barking up uh, uh, unnecessary trees at the moment. Let's uh, let's not get let's not get sidetracked. Um, hmm? Yes, sir. You were saying earlier about uh, how we knew the answers and the questions were covered. No, I didn't say that. I simply said 20th century man has been described as a person who runs down the straight street shouting, "I have the answers. What are the questions?" I didn't say he knew the answers. No, I, I beg mean, my <laughs> Well, you mentioned both cases. Uh, both the cause and effect uh, <coughs> predictions increase that thing even more so. Well, another peculiarity about the speed of light, there's a cause and effect occur, occur simultaneously. And there is no, no, no longer does cause precede effect. That's a very difficult thing to get used to in our world. The effects come first, the causes come later because thought travels much faster than light. Now this is a theme of a new, the, of a causality in the electric age. It is only thought that can travel faster than light. Think about it. You can well, go very, very much faster. You can go from here to anywhere in the universe and back again in thought. Instantly. Instantly. It takes a long time for light to move that fast. No, they, fortunately for mankind, our thoughts are enormously faster than light. And. Uh, Therefore, we have uh, some likelihood of uh, controlling it and putting it under some sort of order. <coughs> yes, sir. If words are garbage and the whole if idea what is? If word, there's a there's a link between words and garbage in that. Well, uh, there, there, there are things that. Uh, we didn't say so, you know. No, you, but I'm, I'm I'm assuming it in that there there are another way that men put on themselves in that they create a local habitation and they give make every nothing's real by naming giving giving the names. Name. My point is, my question is, uh, can man keep up with thought by continually naming it? Will he, will he be well, able not to... Not just won't. Keep up with thought. Will he be able to think as fast I as mean, he can name the thought? Just a moment. It is the, it, thought is the speed in question, not light. So he can keep up with his own thought. But he's got to keep naming it, doesn't he? No. Uh, there are other nonverbal ways of designing situations. However, I, I'm not sure. What do you have in mind, then? So no, I just, I just suppose see man as, as in a situation where he thinks by words. There is, he, there, this is, will only keep up with his ability there's to no other way of thinking. Thought. There's no other way of thinking, but I was going to mention a, a strange thing that has been, we've been talking about lately. In the, the Greek world, when the alphabet was new and Euclid was new, they had never had visual space before. Before visual space or Euclidean space, which came along just at Plato's time, people had used uh, what we now have again, audile tactile space, touch and involvement. And with the alphabet, uh, Western man for the first time got detachment from this type of involvement. He abstracted himself from this involvement. And he began to pay attention to the way in which his mind worked. Prior to this period, uh, the, human, the operations of the human intellect had been subliminal, obscure. But with Plato and Aristotle, they began to notice the way the cognitive patterns worked and so on, and they began to analyze and logicalize and dialecticize and so on. Now, that was for the first time in human history that everything had been subliminal in the private mind up to that time. Then suddenly they pushed the subliminal part of the mind up into inspectable form. Now, that lasted until the Renaissance when they pushed it down again and uh, in favor of a big Copernican worldview, which of mind for a while. But today, I suggest that the electric thing has 
made possible the pushing up of the corporate human mind into inspection. That uh, the speed of light in our interchanges and dialogue makes possible for man to know for the first time the way the social subliminal selves and selves of culture actually work cognitively. That it will now become possible to cognize and recognize the actual modes of operation of corporate intellect, not just private. And that's what I'm trying to do in media study. The media are not private, but corporate services and extensions of our own faculties. And to try to discover their cognitive forms and the ways in which they play upon each other and speak to each other, to work out an epistemology, in other words, of corporate existence, as the Greeks worked out a, an epistemology of private existence. The Greeks discovered a, an epistemology or patterns of cognition uh, that applied to individual lives. And remember, the individual was new. They invented the individual. Today, we have invented corporate man tribally together. And he has his own cognitive structure, and it may be possible for us to be the first people to do for the, our group structure what the Greeks did for the private one. That is possible. Anyway, uh, I'll just mention it. I was just going to say, uh, thinking of the word can be in quotes, and if you'd be able to... I was so using similar things outside of our experience into our corporate body, into our corporate body, yes. incorporate. 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 In include. Incorporate. Include. The, include. Right. And the, 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 so, the total uh, instant awareness and the simultaneous awareness into our own corporate minds. This is what we intend to be doing with the media all the time. Well, now, that's pretty heavy. That's pretty heavy going. And uh, I think that we ought to have, ought to, what is the time getting to be? I think we ought to have a bit of a cold cider, <coughs> and uh, that's about all that's available for this many. There's a young lady who hasn't had a question yet. Well, right. then we can talk, you see, during the break. What do you consider some of the undesirable dimensions of the telephone? Oh, the telephone? Yeah. Well, as you know, the European hates the telephone. That's why he's careful to have a very inefficient telephone system, so no <laughs> nobody will be tempted to use it. <laughs> now. He, he is horrified at the invasion of privacy by the telephone. And the telephone is an absolute uh, tyrant uh, for invading privacy. And the European is very proud of his privacy. It, now, here's, an, here's one for you to play with. North Americans are the only people in the world who go outside to be alone and inside to be together. All other ma mankind everywhere in the world go outside to be together and inside to be alone. Now, I finally discovered why Americans are reverse the ordinary human pattern. But it, I'm not sure that it's holding up very well under electric conditions either, but it's held up for two or three centuries, two centuries. And the reason, as far as I've been able to discover, is that North Americans are the only people who ever came to a continent with technology determined to tame nature and subdue the elements. All other human beings approached nature ecologically and uh, somewhat timidly and slowly and over centuries and centuries gradually came to terms with it, but not. Renaissance man came here in the 16th century to tame a cruel and brutal wilderness. So what we've done to nature on this continent is smash it with technology. Now, this Renaissance man had gunpowder and he had... Uh, lots of machi <coughs> machinery and printing and so on for organizing his life and railways and such. So nobody else ever had that sort of technology to start into a continent with before, so it was an experiment. But as a result of attacking nature, instead of living ecologically with nature, as a, as a result of attacking it, <coughs> we have come to regard nature outside as the place for the lonely hunter. We go outside to be a lonely crowd in North America. And in fiction and in entertainment, our typical figures are lonely, like whether it's Melville and Moby Dick 
or whether it's the gumshoe, the dick, the private eye, and the individual entrepreneur. These people are inheritors of a warfare that began against the wilderness. Now today we have so much power, the wilderness has collapsed and we're trying to hold it up and give it artificial respiration. Uh, it's a broken, poor, broken wreck, uh, thanks to uh, excessive power and, and beating. Question? Uh, but no, this, as a result, Americans are the, you, you, we, every, uh, when I say Americans, I mean North Americans, because it's <coughs> equally true of Canadians. We go outside to be alone, and we go outside for recreation, whereas Europeans go inside for recreation, and go inside to be alone. And the telephone, that's where the telephone came from. The d motor car is our ideal of solitude, the big car. We go outside in our cars to be alone. And just as a little psychological ploy, let me just say that Peter Drucker points out that the first management courses given in the world were given to German businessmen in the 1870s on how to use a telephone. <laughs> Which is a terrifying instrument. <laughs> um, the telephone, uh, uh, let me mention, one, one, in one respect, for example, next time you're on the telephone, just ask yourself, can I see the party at the other end? Um, now, let me prophesy something. If the party at the other end is well, someone you know very well, it's a relative, you cannot see them. But if it's a stranger, you can. Now, why do you think the telephone permits you to see strangers but not friends when in use? This is, a, this is part of its mystery. If and it goes very deep. If you've seen them once, you can see them. But if you've never seen them, you can see somebody that will turn out to be quite different. Oh, yes. Well, that doesn't matter. You but if you've seen them once, you can reconstruct If they're a total stranger at the other end, you can always form an image of them. Yeah. And this is quite a surprise when you see them after. But uh, the telephone is demands total involvement of all our senses. It's a very, very poor image, aud auditory acoustic image, very poor. And that's why it demands so much. Radio, on the other hand, is not the least bit like telephone. It does not demand the same intense involvement. And uh, the telephone, though, is a, a very peculiar instrument and exceedingly intimate. One of the most obscene of all instruments. Why do you not feel as intimidating giving a thing over over the radio as you would over the telephone. Well, as I say, the telephone takes, puts me on totally, whereas radio leaves me relatively free. <laughs> Why? Radio is a hot medium. It doesn't involve you. A cool medium drags you in, makes you part of it. Is that because you're only talking to one person? And it no, it has no, it nothing to do with the numbers. It has to do with, no, it has to do with the fact you have a very <laughs> poor image. You hear very little on the telephone. You have to work very hard. What about a two-way video telephone? Video intercom? A two-way video telephone. Well, well all right. What about it? <coughs> I mean, you'd be, you'd, you're, on the, you're, you're, on, you're broadcasting. The moment you pick it up, you're on the air. <laughs> you're sunk. That allows you to see it. Oh, oh, wouldn't it? And they to see you. No, no, but we'll never come to using that instrument to, except by uh, uh, with, uh, with all sorts of chastity belts around us and everything. <laughs> the, uh, it's a terrifying instrument, the uh, uh, video phone. <laughs> Grab your costume before you're seen. Yeah. Right apart from that, it's <laughs> not, I assure you, the video phone is a terrifying instrument. They're, they've already uh, junked it, you know. They've, they've uh, sampled around to find out what would happen and given up. Doesn't work. Except for diagrams. It might work if the image is slightly out of focus and we're some limited light. No, no, no. There is a solution. There is. No, no, because that'll be like the telephone. It's uh, very no, poor. I poor think image. the conference is a lot softer and you don't see the person no. properly, but you can recognize who it is. But don't you realize that this demands even more involvement? Well, that's, that's like mist on the moors tonight. Very. You see, the moment you're involved, you, you're, you think you're being poetic. <laughs> mist on the moors tonight. Very poetic. Why? Very involving. <laughs> Poetry involves, and prose leaves you free. Spells it out. Well, these are simple dynamic patterns of fact. Um, yeah, well, no, just a moment. We're getting the same hands over and over. Why not have a, a new one? Uh, because I, I think 
Okay, there's a new one. <laughs> but it's... No, it was something else I was going to say. I was going to go back to your, your point about... Um, you mentioned very briefly predicting the future yes. when you were talking about yes. the today. But then you also said before that that we are living in in, in a present. In a that includes present. the future, yes. It's a, it's a way ahead of 1984. In fact, 1984 I, I happened in 1934 and is a, a, no, a novel about the past, not the present. <coughs> 1984 all happened before the book was written. And uh, this is what we call the future ordinarily, some tame and broken down little fantasy that really uh, has nothing to do with where it's at. Just as Marx, Marxism all happened before Marx wrote, this is a, a beautiful expose of what had happened before Marx finally got around to packaging it. Marx has entirely a 19th century dream of uh, welfare and uh, so on. It has nothing to do with the electric age. Nothing. To the production line of the, of the 19th century. Marx is absolutely useless to the electric age, but he does provide fun and games for those who like to brawl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does, literally. For people who are, get bored, stiff, and want to have a, a scrap, why, this is a cause, a, a, a justifiable reason for fighting. What boredom. Gap does he fill? Hmm? What gap does he fill? Oh, just boredom. It, it ends the boredom <laughs> for most people with 19th century minds who need a scrap. <laughs> People with 19th century minds who have to have a fight in order to have the illusion of being alive, uh, they will go for Marx. How many of those are left around? How many 19th century minds? Yeah. 99.9%. <laughs> hangover. <laughs> yes. Our main hangover. I think you're way back to something you said. Uh, did you not say um, poets take garbage and make... Yes, this is uh, Yeats. Read his wonderful poem, The Circus Animal's Desertion. It's on this theme. Okay, well, forgetting Yeats for a moment. <laughs> I can't forget him, but you go ahead. <laughs> do, you not, do, you, do you jump the whole idea of a poet isolating a moment, uh, the job of a photo, that poets sort of isolate a moment they might have found particularly beautiful? Oh, you mean giving it an imperishable... Maybe. Vehicle. You well, no, the vehicle is the imperishable moment. It's, uh, done, you don't first find a, a, a perfect moment and then pack <coughs> it. Uh -uh. What do you do? No, you, the, the packaging is the moment of perfection. Oh. Making, in other words, it's making. You see, well, what does that leave with him when he said he, he, he was in love? I mean, what does that leave that? Wasn't that beautiful? I didn't say that it was or it wasn't. It's that... The per if you already have the perfect experience and you wish to transmit it right. by package, mm -hmm. uh, that you would not be a poet. You would be only a producer-consumer, entrepreneur, merchant. hardware merchant. The poet makes the beauty that he sends on to you. He doesn't find it and match it with some ideal vehicle. It's made, and uh, poetry is making. The word means making, poeia. So that, oh, yeah. the, so that the actual original experience was just maybe perhaps a, a, a start of Well, look, the man's power to <coughs> see, to know, to cognize is making. Yeah. And so we can all be poets in the act of cognizing and recognizing. And by the way, apropos that recognizing, the I think that the uh, instant uh, replay is probably the most poetic technology that was ever devised by man. It's close to the very act of making. It is a, it is a great instrument. Uh, heaven knows what uses will be found for it, but, I mean, eventually, but it is a great and poetic mimetic instrument yeah. and far more exciting than the game it replays. I always miss it when I go to a real game. <laughs> well, that's fair <laughs> enough, but uh, that's just uh, being sociable. Many people prefer to take the set with them for the replays. <laughs> that is literally true. Many people prefer the replays to the game. Ask a professor Why? who just marks his papers while the play is going on and stops the replay. Ask the kids now who, you know, reject the game and just hang on for the replay. Is this because they know what's going to happen? No, because, it, because the thrill is in watching the process, not the fact. You see, the play is only fact, whereas the replay is process, and it's much richer than the original play.
the latest word is, Marshal, that they're putting up the replay in the stadium now themselves so that people can see the replay instead of watching the game. <laughs> that figures. It, it really figures. But it's that last week. No, we're talking also about the coaches using instant, I mean, the, the referees using instant replay. There was a recent <laughs> event in which the coaches, or the referees, actually waited for the replay before making the decision on the play. Oh, the instant, the instant, the instant. Yes, but what about, what about seeing that instant replay over and over? Say, take for example, you watch a brilliant, uh, can I go to the Team Canada series, no. where you say you watch Frank Mahalich's goal, and then a lot of people might know what I'm talking Paul about. Henderson's goal. <laughs> now, the instant replay happened right away. That was pretty exciting. But you were with a friend. You walk into the, your friend, and the TV set's on, and he, they didn't see the Team Canada series, and you say, oh, watch this. You've got to watch this. Just see how beautiful that, that goal is. Just see how he stuck him up there. I mean, you're not, well, at least not consciously, you're not referring to the technical thing. And you, you've seen it again and again, so you're not really amazed by the fact that you've seen it three times. We had a man. You're watching the skill of that man. We had a man here from. Russian. We had a man here from Yale this week, for Bill Wimsett. <laughs> he is used to be seven feet high. Says he's lost an inch. <laughs> uh, he's now only six <laughs> eleven. But he is a critic of poetry, and he went to uh, Iceland to see the Bobby Fischer and uh, Spassky games, and he said to me that uh, he's a, a chess buff or fan, but he said the excitement of chess to me is the excitement I get in poetry by watching every single play conforming and shaping all the other plays. When you're following a process, you begin to see how the whole thing interrelates and everything depends upon everything in the structure. Process opens your eyes to structure, not to just a point of view. It opens your understanding of process to structure. Read a wonderful book by Piaget, just out, paperback, called Structuralism. It's a history of structure and gestalt. Very useful. So you're saying that, like, if my friend comes in and I say to him, uh, watch this play and watch how he takes up that defenseman, I'm getting a bigger thrill out of being able to well, do now, that than... No, what, uh, what you might uh, consider is that uh, hockey... <coughs> Uh, a person completely familiar with ice, ice hockey would be much more interested in the process than in the play. Whereas the ordinary fan just following the results, the effects, and not the causes, would be more interested in the final end result. Like the fight that's now going on between uh, the, high, uh, the heavyweights. Is it, it's on now, isn't it? About now? 9.30. Yes, sir? Uh, this is a question, actually. Uh, I can wait. Yes, question? Yes. I don't understand why the instant replay is mimesis in the sense of mi uh, mimicking the act of making instead oh, no, of no, the no, sense no, 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 no. Mimicking, mimicking is an act of making. And so, but you, but notice, it's in another acting. medium. You replay something that took place in one medium and you put it in another medium. It's translated into another material. That is the nature of mimesis. Poetic mimesis means snatching one mode of experience and putting it into another mode, namely language or pigment or so on, or dance. So it, uh, mimesis is translation. It's metaphor. Yeah. Is that adapting a 15th or 16th century idea of poetry to the 20th century? Should that idea change? Not if it refers to the actual faculties that we all seem to share around the globe the faculty for apprehending, sensing, and processing, and intelligizing, and so on. These, that process of cognition is the process of making. Making sense is consciousness. Consciousness literally is making sense, because without the, uh, most creatures have sensation but no consciousness because they have no capacity to make sense. They just have sense but don't make it. But doesn't that call for a, a redefinition of what we're talking about then? It might. Go ahead. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> why, don't, why, 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 don't you, uh, why don't you try yourself? Well, unfortunately, I'm still hung up at the point where I can't think without thinking words. So. Words are uh, the uh, indispensable vehicles and means, <laughs> counters of structuralizing our thoughts. I, say, I think words are 
absolutely <coughs> indispensable. I didn't suggest they weren't, did I? Anyway, I think we ought to take a little break. Uh, yeah, just kind of uh, stretch and...